welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today we are going to talk about open book law school exams and what sort of exams you might see after the changes to law school due to the COVID-19 outbreak. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess, that's me. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website Career Dicta. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're talking about how to make a smooth transition to open book and take-home exams since, well, most people are likely to have these this semester. And just for the record, we are recording this on Monday, March 30th, so we don't know what happens in the future. All right, Lee, well, I mean, (laughs) at this point, I think we're assuming... It still cracks me up that we have to do that. I know, right? (laughs) We've never done that before until this situation. We've Um, never, yeah, we've never had to do that. We don't know if like every law school implodes in two days. It totally could happen. Um alien abduction. I don't know. I feel like anything's fair game right now. So back to the point. Um, We're assuming really most law schools, if not all, are going to be doing some type of open book or take home exams, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know what else they're going to do because, I mean, we just got word in the Bay Area that we're now in shelter in place until May 1st. I think most law schools are going to start doing exams the first week of May. Oh, you didn't? Well, yeah. see, you've been doing other things I was out instead doing of my, yeah, I was doing my checking good, your phone constantly. I was doing my good deed for the week, delivering groceries to homebound people for the food bank. <laughs> <laughs> see? So while you were doing that, um, the shelter-in-place uh, order was continued. So I think that, you know, as this unfolds, it's becoming more and more realistic that students are going to be taking these exams in the quote-unquote conference of their own home, and then the schools are going to have to shift because that means that these even these 1L classes that typically are never given in a take-home type of environment um, are going to become take-home exams, and that's going to be a a bit of a change for the professors, too. Oh, for sure. I mean, the only other thing I was thinking is, like, maybe there's a way that some people could do multiple choice if they did it online or something, but I think, generally speaking, we're going to be mm-hmm. looking at some type of take-home essay type thing. I mean, I did have... Definitely my Civ Pro exam my first semester was a take-home. I think that might have been the only one my first year. Um, but... You know, I think number one, people, you know, you want to try to find out as soon as possible what type of exams your professor at least thinks they're going to be giving you. Um, and, you know, realistically, mm-hmm. they might even know, not know yet. But I would definitely start asking about this because let's talk about like, some different options. What could people do here? Well, um, I think probably what I would guess they're going, people are going to see are these kind of timed take home whether they be like a three or a four hour take home where you check it out at a certain time and you have to send it in at a certain time or like the 24 hour take home, which I think you usually see in more upper division classes. Yeah. I mean, my Civ Pro was a 24 hour take home, but he did that, our professor, for a very specific reason in that he thought, you know, this is something Mm -hmm. you might actually see as a young associate in practice as someone might give you an assignment that they need an answer to in 24 hours. So he just felt like it was a more realistic, like real world type thing. I mean, I've seen you know, three to four hour type of things. I've seen eight hour take homes. I've never actually had one of those. Apparently they're horrific. Um, Mm -hmm. 24 hour, sometimes more than 24 hours. I mean, friends of mine first year even had a 48 hour take home, I think. So, you know, yeah, it was weird. They could also work in a group. I don't, people had their own opinions about (laughs) how to teach first year classes at Columbia. But anyway, (laughs) those are probably pretty, like, I think probably the most likely options are either going to be, you know, the four hour, eight hour, 24 hour. Um, Or, I mean, it's possible some people, some schools may try to still do in-class exams. I think that's becoming increasingly less likely. Um, I mean, it seems logistically challenging too if they've told people to leave, but I guess it's not completely out of the question. But I think most places are going to have to send take-homes because what else are they going to do? Yeah, and they've sent everybody home. I mean, I don't know how they could call everybody back right. to campus yeah, it's, with travel and all of that stuff. It seems pretty much impossible. If law schools are listening to this, law school administrators, don't do that. Just make them take home. <laughs> Please don't do that. Just do the take home exams. Don't make this like more dangerous and stressful than it needs to be um, already. I think that what will be interesting to see what the law schools also do is if they want to try and kind of mimic the more typical 1L exam where it's three or four hours. Um, is what the technic 
or the technology logistics are going to be of that. You know, how are you going to quote unquote get the exam? How are you going to turn it in and have it time stamped? You know, what are registrars right. going to do? Are they going to try and use, you know, some sort of testing software? I think there's a lot of logistics that are still kind of up in the air and it'll be interesting to see how they end up deciding to do it. Um, but as they're figuring this out, you definitely want to ask questions <laughs> because they, they have time to figure it out, but you don't want to get this information, you know, three or four weeks from now when you're really in the middle of like finally prepping for exam. Well, and I think the other thing schools need to be careful about and people need to be aware of is, you know, say that you're taking four classes and you have your exam spread out over a week, but each of those classes decides to give you a 24 hour take home. Well, assuming you're going to stay up for basically oh, yeah. 24 hours, you can't like that probably doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, I, I remember mm -hmm. in our case, the 24 hour exam was our final exam and they did that on purpose so that you could do your other exams. And then, you know, if you want to pull it all night or go for it. But, you know, if you're right. looking at thinking you're going to do that three or four times in a week, that may not be really realistic. Yeah. And some students I know that we've been getting emails from um, and our tutoring students are taking, you know, one elective in a different campus or a different oh, school. Fun. I know someone we spoke to is taking an elective like at the public policy school or something like that. But those final exam schedules could also be very different. And so if you you really need to take the information from all the professors and look at your schedule and make sure that it's going to be possible. Right. Yeah, I just think and that's on you, not on the school. Like that that's your responsibility as a student. Right. And also you can go ask the registrars for accommodations, but you've got to own your own reality. Right. And I was gonna actually make that point around accommodations as well. You know, if you do get say time and a half, like does that mean you get twenty four hours plus twelve hours? You know, like what does this even mean in this context? Mm -hmm. Um, and how does that play out, you know, if you only have whatever half a day then until your next exam, you just gotta make sure that, you know, you've kind of looked at these things and laid them out for yourself and said like okay this can or cannot work and if it can't work like go talk to someone as soon as possible i mean don't go talk to them but try to communicate with them as quickly <laughs> as possible and i think if you are someone who does get accommodations and you're thinking through your needs given where you are living or trying to study that's another thing you want to start thinking through now and you know your office of disability services i would assume at the school is still up and running because everybody's doing distance learning and your registrar and your dean's office, like all of those, um, you should still be able to answer your questions, but everybody's getting inundated with so many emails that start now. If you've got questions, start now because nobody's responding in five minutes. Right, right. Now. and I might even pick up the phone. I know it's kind of anathema to most people, but you could pick up the phone and call them. And if someone answers, they're probably more likely to be able to give you an answer than if you just send them an email and have to wait for days. In our new COVID reality, though, wouldn't it be sending a Zoom all, like room and you can be like, can we meet you in the Zoom uh, room? Have you <laughs> heard about this new app I heard about last night on a Zoom party call um, called Marco Polo? No. This is apparently like what the hip <laughs> kids are doing. So I don't even quite understand it. I haven't had time to look at it. But apparently instead of sending a text message, you send like a call or something. I don't know. The whole thing seems crazy. Anyway, if you want to be on the cutting edge, go look up Marco Polo. Um, <laughs> Marco Polo. Yeah, apparently it's the cutting edge app of the of the COVID situation. Anyway, um, back to our actual <laughs> podcast topic. Um, all right, so I think our advice is on the take homes. Make sure you know to the extent possible how much time you have. You know what's going to be allowed. If it is a longer type of exam, oftentimes there's a page limit, so you want to be aware of that. Sometimes those page limits can be very very mm -hmm. strict, so you want to make sure you're incorporating that yeah. into your practice, which we'll talk about. Um, but, you know, you really want to understand what is this exam likely to look like? And let's dive into that. I mean, if people have been used to having in-class closed book exams where they have to rely really heavily on memorizing the law, maybe it's a racehorse thing, they're just trying to get it out as quickly as possible, maybe fairly limited analysis. I think these exams are going to be pretty different for a lot of people. I think that's true. I mean, the questions are going to have to be harder right. um, and require more in-depth analysis because everyone's going to have the universe open to them. And I think the longer that time period, the more nuanced the question is going to be. Oh, for because sure. They're giving you time to noodle and edit and research and think. Um, you know, I remember the couple 24-hour take-homes I did. Like, you really, 
like the questions were sophisticated. You were basically writing a paper. <laughs> you weren't like writing an ex- It didn't feel like an exam answer. It felt like a paper, a timed paper, which I think is very different than what most people would expect from an issue spotter. Right. I mean, you know, I'm thinking about the Civ Pro one I had because it was all, it was completely like that. I mean, it was a very ambiguous question. You know, it was extremely difficult. Um, and compared to sort of an average in-class Civ Pro exam where it's going to be like, here's a question about personal jurisdiction, you know, like write about it. These are going to be more difficult. You know, it's going to be the more subtle points that you might have covered. Obviously, you still need to know the basic law. You know, you need to know the rules and the elements and have all of that kind of very structured for yourself. But it's probably going to require you to go deeper. I mean, they have to, I mean, even if it's pass fail, mm-hmm. say, I was going to say they have to curve it some way, but a lot of places that won't be actually the case. But, you know, your professors still want to see right. that you really can engage with this material and that you understand it. And I think the professors are also going to assume that your writing is going to be so much cleaner. Right. You know, you're going to need to include, I think we're going to get into this in a bit, but you have to really realize that they're expecting a different presentation than the racehorse test. Right. Where typos are kind of acceptable and maybe, you know, a missing word or here or there, or like you're not including case names. You know, all of those kind of allowances that many law students are used to kind of go out the window when you have an open book, longer time um, to do these questions because professors are hoping they're going to be much easier to read. Yeah. And so, you know, if it's still three or four hours, whatever, it's probably going to be sit down, like do your brain dump, hopefully do an outline of some type. But if you have eight hours or even 24 or more, they're definitely going to be expecting a different quality of just presentation, as you say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, this in-depth knowledge um, really means that you need to be spending your study time really learning the rules element by element and structuring your outline with those elements and practice, practice, practice with some more practice executing the analysis because your analysis has to be flawless because there's no memorization element to it whatsoever. Yeah. So, I mean, the good news is it's all about, can you do, do the question? Yeah. I mean, all that time you would have spent memorizing is basically time you can be spending doing other things now. So I think part of the issue here, too, though, is if your professors have only given a certain type of in-class closed book exam and you have sample questions, those may or may not be that closely related to what they do in this new version. So, of course, you want to look at those and practice on them. But, you know, you may want to ask them, like, how might you change this? Or could you give us a sample question of what you think you might do this? I mean, maybe they do nothing different, but I think they're probably going to do some stuff differently. Yeah, I think that that's true. And, you know, if your professors are a little wishy-washy about this, when you ask them for more details, I think it's important to realize that a lot of them are trying to change what they do, and professors typically don't like to change very quickly. And so you may have to come back to them, like, week after week and be like, have you thought any more about the format? You know, try and be really kind, because I think that they are being put in a situation that is not where they're used to excelling, which is being flexible and accommodating lots of new situations, but you also want to continue to nudge them to make sure that they're going to give you an, like information on what's supposed to happen. Right. I think, you know, view this as a team effort. Like we want to do, you know, we want to give you what you're looking for on this exam, but in order to do that, we need to know what your expectations are so we can prepare adequately. Um, exactly. So one thing I think people sometimes really get caught you know, kind of off track on here is they think, oh, I don't have to memorize these rules. I can just look everything up. That is a terrible idea. Um, you know, even it terrible, terrible. I mean, I had all almost all open book exams and I could still tell you about the law when I walked into that room. Um, you know, even with mm-hmm. an eight hour exam or really even a 24 hour exam, like you still need that knowledge in your head. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be word for word as it might be on a closed book exam, although you still want to be able to write this out quickly. Because people may hear eight hours and think like, oh my gosh, that's so much time. It is not a lot of time. Even 24 hours is not a lot of time. Um, You know, so you don't want to be kind of wondering what these rules are. And more importantly, you can't spot issues if you don't understand the law. You know, like you need a granular knowledge of the Mm -hmm. law so that you can read this question and that triggers something in your brain. If you don't have that information in your brain, you're going to be kind of dead in the water here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can make outlines and you should probably make cheat sheets, like a one to two page cheat sheet, but it's not just making that material. I think that a lot of students can fall into the trap with an open book exam, which is like, okay, I will make these 
materials and then I can reference them and I'm good. And it's like, no, you can make these materials and you must practice with them and you must, you know, really understand them and learn them and be able to test yourself finding rules quickly and making sure that they really speak to you. You know, you can't just take somebody's outline that you think is very complete and put your name right. on it and decide that you're ready for an open book exam. And I, I know there are going to be people in law school who are going to think that that's a, the answer. And unfortunately, that is not going to serve most people well. No, I mean, I've done that one, you know, where it's like, oh, I'm good. I just have this 100 page outline that somebody else wrote in a class that I basically like, am, you know, totally floundering in. I'll be good. Yeah, not a great plan. Yeah. Um, you know, even if you do start with someone else's outline, you need to make sure that you understand that, that you've made it your own. You know, are you taking it and condensing it down so that you have a, sh a cheat sheet in front of you? Are you making flow charts, you know, so that you can just ask yourself yes or no questions? Like there are ways to use other people's materials very effectively. And maybe you're in a situation time wise where that absolutely makes sense. And I totally respect that. But you have to make mm -hmm. it your own. Yeah. Yeah. Just having outlines doesn't mean that you have a mastery of the material. Like no. the outline is just the starting point. One time that ever and worked so, for me, um, I, you all I had a 48 hour uh, exam on like EU law. And I was not particularly like interested in this class. And a friend of mine at a different school sent me the most amazing outline I'd ever seen. And I was like, you know what? I'm a 3L, 48 hours, a perfect outline. I think I can do this. <laughs> but that is an exception, not the rule. Right. And I got yeah. an A in that class. Yeah. Uh <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I think I remember being kind of flummoxed. Oh, I remember being, I think I was a 3L. Um, and I was taking employment law. And the I was the number two editor in the law review and the editor-in-chief in the law review, he had been like the high score of that class previously. And I asked him for his outline and he's like, oh, sure. And he sent it to me. And I was feeling so good about myself because I had his outline in my back pocket until I opened it up the day <laughs> I was going to like start using it. And I could barely follow it. I mean, it was just, he was a brilliant person. He's a great lawyer, but like it was, they had no formatting. It was very like stream of consciousness. <laughs> it just did not, it did not work for me. And I kind of went, uh oh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I could go like control F to like look up keywords and see what he wrote about certain things. But it was not it was not the way that I was going to be able to excel in that class. I could reference it, but I had to build my own materials. And I think that that does tend to be more the rule than the exception. You know, you got to make this stuff speak for yourself and you really need to practice using these materials. I know that we've talked about in other podcasts the importance of taking longer outlines and tabbing them or making an index and making it a lot easier for you to reference it while you're practicing because you want to get used to using those materials. Um, so in the exam isn't the first time you're looking through them. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a situation where you definitely want to start thinking really early about what you want to have in front of you when you're taking this exam. So like you said, you know, you can start with a long outline, you can start with a commercial outline, it doesn't really matter. You can make your own, do whatever. But you also, you know, you almost certainly want to have like that one to two page cheat sheet where it's like, what are, you know, say we're doing torts, like, here is my like overview of torts. Okay, you know, I've got intentional torts, I've got negligence, I maybe got some other things, you know, and it's just, a very, it fits on a couple of pages and it's in front of you so that when you're reading that question, you're thinking, oh, should I be looking for intentional torts? Why, yes, perhaps I should. Should I be looking for negligence? Probably, you know, so that you don't really overlook something and write Say it's a multi-part question and you think it's all about negligence, but actually half of it's about intentional torts. You know, you want to make sure that you really got something in front of you that's going to trigger you to think about these things that you need to consider. Yeah. And I remember taking like open book exams in law school that were in the room, but were that three to four hour structure. And oftentimes I never even really dug into my full length. Outline. Oh, no. I mean, pretty much took the exam just off the cheat sheet. Yeah, which is Maybe what I flipped you to one should do. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, right. And so, but I think that even if it's a longer take home, I think you want to have that level of comfort with the material of, I really could probably do this mostly from the cheat sheets. And I'm only referencing and diving down for more sophisticated issues where I need to do additional research. Yeah. I mean, when I would go into an open book exam, I would basically have my one to two page cheat sheet. I would have a longer outline that was not my own because I didn't make a lot outlines really. I made flow charts. Um, and I would have tap, like you said, tap that up, have an index, have a table of contents. You know, I'd practice using it. So if I did need to look something up, I knew how to find it. And then I would have the flowcharts that I'd made. And so basically, you know, my process was essentially if I was freaking out, like, 
look at the cheat sheet. Okay, what, what zone are we in? All right, where's a flow chart on that? Great. Okay, pull out that flow chart, put it in front of me, you know, make a pre-writing outline where I've got the elements of the rule, I've got the facts that I want to talk about or the arguments. Because um, your professor is looking for a really logical structure. Um, they're not looking for just like, mm-hmm. I saw this issue and here's what I have to say about it. You know, they're looking for you to do this in a structured way because they know you have all the stuff in front of you. Right. And that is why once you get these materials made, you have to practice with them because yeah. you have to figure if your school is even pass fail, you want your answer to stand out in a good way. And it's going to do that with better analysis, with clean structure, um, and with clean writing. You know, you have like eye racking and headers and no typos, like all of that kind of stuff, a level of professionalism. Um, and you kind of have to practice all of that to be able to do that under these conditions, whatever the conditions are. Yeah, I mean, your professor is still probably going to know whose exam is which by the end after they turn in their grades, even if it's pass fail. And if, you know, if somebody did a standout exam and that person goes to office hours, the professor is probably going to be like, wow, you know, Lee did a really great job on that. Like, congratulations, Mm -hmm. you know, like I'm happy to write you a letter of recommendation or whatever, help you with a job, whatever it is, even if it's pass fail, like you're still building those relationships. So, you know, obviously people have different demands at this point on their time, but I think anybody can go in and write a structured exam that doesn't have to do with the knowledge or the time that you have it's really just like you know making those materials work for you doing some practice with them and then being really disciplined on the exam day to actually do this in a structured way yeah all right well let's talk a little bit more about as we get closer to exams and when the exam time comes, like what are the logistics people need to be thinking about um, to pull this off? Well, I mean, <laughs> so yeah, I think, I think the first thing is they need a computer, right? And it needs to be stable and working and probably have internet. Yeah. So I think, you know, your, your school is going to tell you how they're going to do this. And then you want to make sure that you can comply with that. And if you can't, for whatever reason, you need again to get in touch with someone absolutely as soon as possible and tell them what the problem is. Mm hmm. Yeah. And if you like, I mean, we talk about this always in all exam situations, you need to test any exam software that they might be using on your machine and turn off your automatic updates and don't do anything to break the exam software because I mean, it's a nightmare if, if it gets broken. So if they are going to use some sort of exam software, make sure that you are testing it you're running it on your machine. You're not doing automatic updates. Tell Microsoft to calm down. It can wait a week. And, um, you know, and make sure that your computer's running well. Right, because the other problem is you're not going to have any tech support if something goes wrong. You know, there's not going to be a proctor in the room Mm -hmm. or anything like that. I mean, I'm actually, I would be curious to see how schools decide to handle that if, say, they're giving, like, a four-hour take-home exam and then someone's exam software crashes for 20 minutes. I don't know. I mean, that's going to be fun. Um, (laughs) You know, you might want to ask those questions in advance, like, what should I do if this happens? Yeah. Because hopefully they've happen. got an FAQ, but if not, right. But if not, the best way to like encourage them to have one is to ask those questions. Yeah. I mean, I think you just want to think about, I mean, I know certainly I had situations in class exams where exams soft crash more than once. I think you did too. I mean, almost anyone oh, yeah. did. So you yep. just want to make sure you know, like, okay, what am I supposed to do in this scenario? Do I immediately stop and pick up a pencil? Like, do I call someone? Mm-hmm. Do I set a timer? Like, what do I do to make sure that you're not going to be penalized mm-hmm. for that? And that's another interesting point, Allison, that some people do prefer still to hand write out exams. And if that is something that you've always done or that you feel that you need to do, then you need to talk to the school about what the logistics of that are going to be. Right. Are they going to let you do that? Are they going to let you scan them and send them in? Um, you know, I think, again, like it, you really have to think through what the information that's coming from your school and then talk early and often about what your individual needs are. Absolutely. I think these are definitely um, messages that you want to read as soon as you get them. <laughs> you know, this is not the sort of thing that your yeah. school sends out something about how we're doing exams and you put it in your inbox and say, oh, I'll read it, you know, on the weekend when I have time to deal with this. You want to read them immediately and make sure that there's nothing in there that is like going to cause you problems. Yeah, Exactly. I think one of the more challenging logistics for folks in the midst of COVID-19 is where are you going to take this exam? Right. Um, Because finding a place, if you have children or roommates at home, dogs, whatever, um, pets, oh yeah, um, significant other, you know, 
are you going to be able to focus and take this test at home under the time conditions? Um, is the school, if you live near the school, is the school going to allow you any um, private options, any quiet options? Are they going to open up any rooms? Um, I think we don't know, but if you're in an extreme situation or need something very specific for your accommodations, again, start talking to the school early so they I mean because it's possible everybody's flying by the seat of their pants it's possible they haven't even thought of a lot of these individual situations oh for sure um and again like it's possible they may be able to do something if you're like hey you know I cannot take this exam in my house because of x y and z is there any way that I can take it you know in a classroom by myself or in the library or whatever maybe there's an option that that Mm -hmm. can happen yeah maybe you'll never know unless you ask so you might as well you know talk start by talking to them. Yeah, I mean, the other question I think people may have to entertain at some point is like, if your situation is so extreme that it's literally impossible, like, is there a way that you can postpone these and do them later? It's true. Yeah. You know, if it gets to that point, it's like, no, we cannot provide you another space. And you're like, it is literally impossible. Then it's like, all right, we need to talk about what the options are. Yeah, because if you are providing 24 hour childcare and I don't know how you would do a 24 hour take home. I mean, that's yeah. pretty, that would be a lot. Yeah. I mean, maybe you yeah. go to a hotel. I don't know. You know, <laughs> like I think people are like, just are going to have to maybe. think about a lot of different options. Maybe your kid goes and stays with someone else. You know, it's like, we don't know. Maybe there are options, maybe they're not, but definitely yeah. talk to someone. Um, you know, I think you've got to think about picking it up and returning it. Like, is this going to be done virtually? I mean, this is more kind of the school's problem, but what if they do say like, I mean, we used to have to go pick them up. I mean, hopefully that wouldn't be happening. Mm-hmm. But again, like people may have just not really thought about it. Like, oh, you'll just pop by the school and get them. It's like, well, not if I just moved like, halfway across the country. Right. Yep. Um, also, if it's a longer take home, you also need to think about all your physical needs. Like, do you have enough food in the house? Water? Are you going to sleep? When are you going to sleep? I mean, you want to think through that schedule um, of the entirety of the time. So if it's an eight hour take home, you do want to make sure you're eating throughout of it, but you don't want to be maybe cooking. So you want to, um, instead focus on like, what can you have ready to go to pop in the microwave or sandwiches pre-made, or are you going to take a walk in the middle to get some fresh air to clear your mind or do some yoga? I mean, I think there are lots of things that you want to have as options, um, of whatever you need to maintain, um, efficiency and effective exam writing given the conditions yeah and i think this is particularly obviously an issue for the 24-hour ones and here too i mean even these longer exams my advice to people is you've got to really keep a close eye on your time you know 24 hours sounds like a lot of time but it can go really quickly and you want to start writing earlier than you think um so you know i what i would not recommend people do is pick up the exam, like read it, think about it for a while, and then decide that they're going to go to sleep for eight hours. Like I think that is really probably not (laughs) the best plan because when you wake up, that time is going to go really quickly. Um, You know, depending on when you can pick up your exam, I think typically you want to structure your time so that you have at least a draft written of like every part of the question before you go to sleep. And I think you probably should sleep. I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. um, there's no real reason to stay up 24 hours probably not necessary the exams are typically not designed for that to be necessary um so you know i think often having a fresh eye in the morning can be good but like do not do not go and lay down and go to bed before you've actually written a draft because i think that can be disastrous yeah oh and my god please yes. back oh, stuff can up. we also i know back i was seriously <laughs> the same day i'm like use the cloud use the cloud dropbox is amazing well, and use print the cloud. Stuff. well i mean whatever say you're doing exam i mean that's actually you know i don't think you would do a 24-hour exam and exam soft that would be kind of silly but maybe they do but assuming that there's yeah. a way for you to print this off or save it you know save drafts like save a draft that you mark as 4 p.m and then save a different draft at 5 p.m and 6 p.m and mm-hmm. then print some of those because you know we have heard of really horrible things happening when people did not have backups um and yeah. you know you do not want to be in that worst case scenario like at least once an hour save your work under a different file name put it in dropbox and then at least every few hours print it out also i think for these longer Um, exams, make sure you have a buffer at the end to read it and proof it. If they give you 24 hours, they don't want it written with typos. No. They're not going to be okay with that. If a professor gives you an exam for 24 hours, it needs to feel like a paper. Right. It needs to feel like something you present. Like you proofed it. As as like a young (laughs) associate or someone working at a nonprofit or for the government. Like 
this is something that you would be giving to your boss, basically. Right. Yeah. So it needs to be, you know, at a higher level and um, you need to save time to do that. And you need to have a plan of how you're going to proofread. You know, everybody has kind of proofreading tricks that work for them, um, but you need to make your proofreading plan (laughs) so you can um, check that box and move on, but don't leave that to the last 30 minutes. No. And you also want to think about how are you going to turn this back in, you know, make sure that you've got time to save it and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you don't want to be mm-hmm. over the time limit and then realizing that something happened and, you know, just give yourself that breathing room. If you turn it in five minutes early, great. Yeah. Yeah. I would err on the side of five minutes early, <laughs> no matter what. Yeah, for sure. Because yeah. things, I mean, things, happen. things like, happen. What if it, you know, what if that last version gets corrupted and you have to go back to the one right before it? Yeah. You know? I also, my internet went down for like 10 minutes today. Oh, yeah. The internet, I mean, yeah, the internet yeah. across the country is like very sporadic at this point in certain areas. So yeah, you want to, again, like allow for those yeah. things. And again, ask those questions. What am I supposed to do if my internet is down at the time I'm supposed to submit this? Like, who do I call? Yeah. Right. So yeah, kind of nuts. Um, yeah. Kind of nuts. So yeah, I mean, I think, in, you know, if people are listening to this and they're like, oh, I don't need to worry about this. My school's moved to pass fail. Like, I'm sure I'll pass. You still want to be sure that you're doing your best and that you pass, you know? <laughs> However, mm-hmm. you know, at the same time, these are crazy times. And I feel like you really can't drive yourself too nuts trying to prepare for exams if you have other important stuff going on. So, you know, cut yourself a break, but try not to totally dial it in because you want to make sure you're doing enough. And the good news is, you know, if you have a longer take home and it's open book, a really good set of attack plans can actually get you a long way. So if you focus on that in the limited time you have available and then really focus on the exam on presenting this in a way that is professional, you're probably going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think kind of my thought, final thoughts are on this, you know, everybody's health and safety and what their family or network needs is like everybody's priority right now law school is definitely still a priority and you want to be able to check the box on these exams because you know you don't want to fail because that's going to be harder to explain in your transcript nobody's going to talk to you about these passes (laughs) it's like we just want to you know make this work but if you do have extreme stuff going on just reach out to your school i think people are being very compassionate that a lot of different people have various levels of stressors going on i was um, flipping through Instagram the other day and a blogger I follow was lamenting that she'd spent three hours yesterday redoing her nails and I wanted to scream because I was like what <laughs> you know I was like I, I can't like, believe I you spent three that. hours doing your nails <laughs> right exactly you know um, but I I do think that you know, everybody's in a different situation and the schools are going to be compassionate but you need to talk to them about it um, and you know remember that these are extreme times and you know you're going to have to ask for what you need, I think, because a lot of times people aren't even sure what they're supposed to be offering people to yeah. help them be successful. I think that's right. And you know, if you have questions about these exams, ask your professors. You know, that's what they're there for. Yeah. If you don't understand like what their expectations are or you're just not sure about something, just ask them. Yeah. Yeah. We're all in this together. We're all navigating this new frontier together. So we all got to talk about it and not make assumptions um, because we don't even know what everybody's thinking about. Yeah. And people, it's yeah. just, it's also new. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully everybody gets it together. You're going to be fine. And then if you think for some reason that may not be happening or you have questions, just reach out to people early and hopefully it all works out. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, we are out of time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Allison at Lee at LawSchoolToolbox.com or Allison at LawSchoolToolbox.com, or you can always contact us via our website contact form at LawSchoolToolbox.com. And we are doing podcasts based on what people are sending our way. So feel free to send us our questions because that is giving us um, ideas for the content you guys are looking for. And we're happy to answer your questions on the podcast. Thanks for listening. Everybody, please stay safe, stay home, and we'll talk to you soon.